Hey, we're in Romans chapter 1. As you're finding your way there, I hope you've got your Bible with you. I hope and I pray that, again, you'll, you'll bring a notebook uh, as well and uh, that that'll help you uh, to remember uh, what you need to remember. And so uh, uh, get, your, get your Bible out there, get your notebook uh, out there. And uh, we're in Romans chapter 1 today. We've entitled this series Everest. I've always loved the mountains. I've always loved the mountains. I remember not long after coming to Abilene, things were tough back in those days. Uh, um, it, was, it was a tough time. And um, I had gone out to lunch one day with one of our staff members and uh, Jim Corson and Stephen Broadwater, Dr. Broadwater. And we were sitting there at the lunch table one day and um, Jim Corson looked at me and he said, just out of the blue, he said, are you going to stay? And uh, everybody at the table kind of got quiet because Brother Jim just said out loud what everybody was wondering, uh, even myself at the time, are you going to stay? And uh, I looked back at him and I said, yeah. I'm going to stay. I said, now, it's not home. Uh, I miss the mountains. And Dr. Broadwater looked at me and said, buy a picture. And so if you go into my office uh, today, there, on the wall, there's a great big picture from Pr Pretty Place Chapel, the old North, what, Camp North Greenville or Camp Greenville uh, up there uh, where we had been for 11 years hanging on my wall. I love the mountains. My family's from uh, East Tennessee, the mountains. I've always loved the mountains. But when you begin to think of mountains, we've got the Smoky Mountains, and there's, there's something special about the Smoky Mountains, and you've got the Rockies, something magnificent uh, about the uh, Rocky Mountains, but there's no comparison. When you start looking at the Himalayas and Everest, there, there's no comparison. And uh, when you look through the books of the Bible, there really is no comparison. Uh, to the book of Romans. Romans, as one writer said, is the Himalayas. Uh, others have even called it the Everest. Some call Romans 8 the Everest. And so what we've done is we're, we're calling our series through the book of Romans the Everest series. And these are mountain, mountain peaks of grace uh, in the book of Romans. And we did a little bit of an intro last time. And this morning we come very much to the very first verse, Romans chapter 1. And when you come to Romans 1 verse 1, Paul's not writing as the man that he used to be. Uh, the writer of the letter to the church at Rome uh, the, is, is not the man that he used to be. Uh, he's not, he wasn't always the man that we find here in these initial verses. Uh, at one time, he was the chief agitator, instigator. He, he was hot on the trail of these Christians. He put them in jail. He, he had them executed. He, he was that man. And now he is the chief uh, proponent, if you will, uh, the chief uh, sharer uh, in the greatest city of his day, the city of Rome, of the Christian faith. And uh, he says several things about it. In verse 1, he tells us about his person. And uh, he tells us about his person. You can look there in Romans uh, chapter 1. I was already over in James. Get back here to Romans chapter 1, Brad. And, uh, but Romans chapter 1, notice what he says there uh, in that first verse. He says, Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God. And so here, first of all, he tells us about his person. Uh, and and there, he uses several words down through here to describe uh, who he is and the mission, the ministry of his, uh, of his life. Uh, first of all, he says that he's a servant. He actually uses the word bondservant. And we looked at that uh, this past Sunday morning at Abilene. And so Paul, writing here, he doesn't just see himself as an ally uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He views himself as a purchased possession, the purchased possession of his master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he had given up full rights to his life. He had given up ownership of his life. And he had given himself over uh, to this all-consuming passion, the ministry, the service uh, uh, his service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now before, we know, Paul made a living by making tents. That, that was his avocation. Uh, but now he is giving his life uh, to changing lives and homes and even cities and nations through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you've got that word bondservant there and behind that, behind that very well-known uh, well term, uh, was a dignity uh, of service 
that Paul didn't just possess by himself. I mean, there, there was a ministry, a dignity uh, behind that word that is available to every single Christian. Uh, Paul was a servant of Jesus Christ, and you and I have been called to be bondservants uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to give up ownership of ourselves, to surrender ourselves completely and fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only that, he was also, as a result of that, an officer, an agent of the king, a service of the king. Let me ask you a question. Would it make a big difference in your life? Would it change your attitude about where you work and where you live and all those sorts of things, all that you're going through, all that you're dealing with, all that you're carrying? Would, would it change your life if you really understood, accepted the fact that you are an agent, you are an officer, you are a, a servant of the king. You are. As a Christian, you are an officer of not just a king, you are an officer of the king of kings. You are a servant of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, you ought to talk like it. You ought to live like it. You ought to act like it. Uh, you ought to work like it. You ought to do your entire life as unto the Lord. And uh, as a result of that, all of the royal treasury of heaven, uh, of your master, is going to be, again, divvied up, given uh, to you <clears throat> as a result of the reward of su such a life. And so he says here, first of all, that he's a bondservant. But not only is he a bondservant, he's an apostle. Uh, that's what he is. He's an apostle. You know, a lot of folks, <clears throat> they, they want to start off at the top. We have a lot of children, young people today, and uh, they get married, and um, they want to have right off the bat what their parents had after 40 years of working and saving. And a lot of people today, they want to get ahead. I mean, they just want to, they want, they want to be at the top of the line, head of the line, just because they showed up. And a lot of folks want to start out at the top instead of having to start at the bottom <clears throat> and work themselves up. A lot of folks want to wear the best robes, the best suits, uh, if you will, <clears throat> without having to work themselves up by wearing those rough everyday work clothes of just humble service. But when you look at what God says in his words, and especially here what Paul says in the book of Romans, God's order is servant and then apostle. Now, we don't have apostles like they had back in that day. You have to be very, very old. If you have somebody in your church who claims to be an apostle, <laughs> they're 2,000 years old because an apostle was one who had to literally see Jesus uh, and, um, but we, we have that, that, that idea of serving him, being his representative that you have here in the word apostle. And so whether our service to God is given in the pulpit, in the choir, in, in the, in the hospital room, whether it's in the prayer closet, whether it's on the mission field, that service is to be an expression of the one will of God, again, who has purchased us, who has, we, we've been bought with a price uh, we are his bond servants, and as a result, he has given us uh, several tasks. Again, those who, again, share a cold cup of water in Jesus' name, they are as lofty in position as the ones who even pass the, uh, the communion trays. And so, again, it might be different, might be, might be a little bit uh, um, um, uh, different from other types of service, but the similarity is that we are all called to serve a common master, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I love watches. I've been really, I've been really tempted here lately to go get an Apple Watch or an iWatch rather, and um, because of some of the functions it has on it. But, but I, I love my old watches. I, I was thinking, I almost brought it with me this morning. Uh, I've got a pocket watch, a railroad watch, and on the back of it, it has all these jewels, and, and, and jewels not necessarily like a ruby, but they're these, they're these pivot points, these joints, if you will. And uh, they allow the mechanism in that watch to swing. And so you, watches are kind of graded by jewels, 17 jewels and those sorts of things. And there are a lot of people, choice people, special people, that are like jewels uh, in a watch. Uh, they're hidden. Uh, they're obscured. Um, not everybody sees what they're doing behind the scenes. But they are valuable. They are valuable in their place. Uh, they're more valuable than all the etchings and carvings and gold and those sorts of things on the exterior uh, of the watch. And uh, because even though they can't be seen, all those little hands in there, those little dials and, and those little levers, they can't be seen by everybody. They're what makes 
that ability, that watch to have the ability to have that precise time. And so if you're one of those hidden ones, if you're one of those ones who serves the Lord behind the scenes, uh, thank God for you because you are faithful and you're being served. Uh, you're being a faithful servant like the Apostle Paul. So Paul said he was called to be a bond servant. He was called to be apostle. That's his person. But then there is his profession. And I, I just use the, the word that gives us why this was his profession. He was called. That, that, that's what it says right there in that very first verse. Uh, he was called uh, to be a, an apostle. That, that's what he was called to do. He was called to be uh, an apostle. And so what does that mean? Well, this was the credentials of his service. This was what made Paul the Apostle Paul. This was uh, what, what gave him the authority to do what he did and to say what he said, uh, that he had this call of God uh, upon his life. And uh, maybe it has a more specific meaning for us today. <clears throat> you know, you're called to a specific area of service. Back in that early day, you were called. Uh, but today we have people called to be pastors, called to be missionaries, uh, called to be music ministers, uh, but without the call, without the call, there's not very much credentials. There's not really much reason for a man to be in public service uh, to things that we would consider religious. I'll be honest with you. People say, I want to be a pastor. Are you silly? Are you out of your mind? You want to be a pastor? I want to be a missionary. Why do you want to be a missionary? Uh, you don't do those things because you want to. You do those things because you have no other option. God has called you. Uh, there are a lot of Mondays. The only thing that keeps me in the ministry, after you've had a bad week, people have chewed on you. It's one of those, you've gone through COVID and half the church is gone, all those sorts of things. The only thing that keeps you in the ministry is the fact that you are called. And so Paul says he was called. And here's what I need you to understand. If the church is to have a divine mission, and by the way, it does then we must believe, we must be convinced that it has divine guidance. And since that is the case, you have this deployment of ministers and those ministers must be in God's hands. So we've got to, re we've got to lament the idea, the fact that today, I mean, it's a sad, sorry case in America today, and especially in America, that there are so few people who bear real evidence of a divine commission upon their life. There are very few people. I mean, there are people filling pulpits all over the place. There are, there are people leading churches all over the place that could do just as well leading some company. There are very few people out there today who have divine evidence of a divine mission and commission upon uh, their life. But here you have this apostle. His call was absolutely evident. And the call, the apostle's call... It was an appointment, if you will. So you're like you're being appointed uh, in the military. It was an appointment to execute a commission, a mission that was so sacred, so vitally important that every single day, everything that you did uh, was lived and, and uh, undertaken with that in mind, that you were commissioned and sent forth, that you were, uh, you, you were sent out, you were deployed by your master, you were called, you are a, you're a bondservant, you're an apostle, and then you have been deployed. But not only was he called, he was separated. And so this is kind of Paul's strategy. Now, that's the way Paul approached his life. He was called, and so he went, about his, he went about his mission, but the way that he did it was through the fact that he was separated. Paul, God doesn't need brilliant people. God doesn't need intellectual people. Uh, what God needs are people who are surrendered and steadfast, that they stick to the task, that they are separated. Now, don't get don't miss out don't misunderstand the, to be separated doesn't mean that you are isolated you you can't be a missionary for god you can't be a minister for god you can't be deployed and by the way every one of us is to be sent all right uh, don't just get the idea that's just for pastors and ministers no all of us as christians we've been sent and we are to be separated we're to be in the world but we're not to be of the world so we're to be insulated from the world but we're not supposed to be isolated from uh the world and so you know, it would make absolutely no sense for God to save people and then pull them out of the area, the arena of that he has called them to go minister to. And so we've been sent, but we're sent separated to go into the world to make a difference uh, for God. God doesn't want his servants to be isolated. 
He wants them to be insulated, but not isolated. And so, you know, electricity, the purpose of insulation in electricity is to prevent the transfer or, or leakage, if you will, of power. Uh, by, it, it, you put a non-conducting substance on top of that. And so <clears throat> it, it keeps you from getting shocked, all right? And so the Christian needs to be insulated against really these disastrous, these weakening effects of an evil and corrupt society that surround him. And by the way, his best insulation is to make sure that his motives are pure, that his ideals are godly, that his purposes uh, are really come from the mission. Uh, and um, that, that's what you need to do. And so what that means is, is that consecration plus concentration. That, that's, that's that little trio. The trio for successful living is completed when we think in this order. Commission, consecration, concentration. So that's his person. But not only do you have his person, you have his, you have his proclamation. Look in verses 2 uh, through 6. Uh, he says down there, he, he talks about his message as the gospel of God. That's at the end of verse 1. And uh, But this message that he's preaching, that he's sharing, this gospel of God, he immediately takes it out of the idea that this is something novel, something new, something original. Uh, this is not some sort of easy, convenient invention uh, like intellectuals today have tried to make out. They're, they're not saying, well, Paul just came up with this idea and there was this idea that kind of gave him the power that he did. No, um, this is not some emergency measure that he came up uh, to, to, to make sense of what happened to Jesus. That's not it at all. Uh, it was the, not the gospel of Paul. It was not the gospel of the disciples. It was the gospel of God. And the proof of that lies in the fact that it predates its actual history. Uh, by hundreds or thousands of years. Before you have Paul preaching here in Romans, you we're going to read about in a minute, you've got all the prophets back there in the Old Testament. You can go back uh, and we even understand that Jesus is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so what we find out is that as Paul challenges Rome, with the claims and the considerations of this message, we understand that the gospel was both prophesied, predicted, and then personified. It was written and then it was revealed. Look in verse 2. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. He said, which he promised before through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so the prophecies, not just the words, to be identified in chapter and verse, but the prophecies, we see them in the ceremonies and the rituals and the holidays and even the persons of the Old Testament. All throughout the Old Testament, you see this. And so, by the way, the, the Old Testament is not just the documentary defense of the gospel. It is the documentary evidence of the gospel. It was prophesied in the Old Testament, but it was personified in Jesus Christ. Look in verses 3 and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from uh, the dead. Hey, the promise became a person. The prophecy, it became a personality. The Scripture, the very Word of God became the Word of God, the Logos. Uh, it became a character. And so the world is asking again today, what's, what's Christianity? We live in a post-Christian world. What, what's Christianity? And scholars and intellectuals, they try to define it. But just like in the scripture, the scripture says, echo homo, behold the man. For Christianity in Christ is a person. And so this personification of the gospel and of salvation in man is, is one of the greatest evidence that it is not of man, it is of God. It is divine in its origin. If God, if man had invented it, <clears throat> man would have given him good advice because that's what God, that's what man likes to do. Man just likes to give you good advice. But the gospel isn't good advice. It's good news. And, uh, and since it's good news, it's understandable. Yeah, it's practical, absolutely. But it's found in a person. If Christianity is is a person, and it is. And if this person is Jesus Christ, and he is, then we just normally naturally have to ask, then who's Jesus? 
Well, Jesus Christ is the great I am. He's the eternal present tense. All Everybody else is past tense when they die. Muhammad, Buddha, they're past tense. Not Jesus. Jesus is the great I am. He is the eternal present tense. He is our greatest contemporary, if you want to put it in that word. And so if you establish, if you can establish the, per, the character of the person, then you can, uh, you, you know that it's Jesus, and then you have established the, the character of Christianity. Christianity is Christ. It, it is based upon Jesus Christ. Real quickly as we wrap up for today, notice three things that it says here about Jesus. It tells us about his humanity uh, in verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. The humanity of Jesus was by birth because that word there is what it means. He was born. Uh, his birth identifies him with a royal family. It traces his lineage all the way back uh, to David, even further back than that. And so the humanity of Christ, it's not some sort of uh, historical accident. It is the fulfillment of a chain of biological, genealogical even, events that finds its fulfillment in a virgin conceiving and bearing a son. And that goes all the way back to the seed of the woman. That's what you read there in that word. That's that, that's that phrase, born of the seed uh, of David. It's the seed of the woman in Genesis, in Genesis 3.15. So that's his humanity. Then his deity. It says in verse 4, And declare to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's the declaration of the deity of Jesus. The declaration is that from the Holy Spirit. And it's the proof. The proof of his deity is the resurrection. And so his birth and his burial are linked together. He was divinely born, but he was also divinely raised. He was born in a virgin tomb, and I like what the one preacher said, he was raised from a virgin tomb. It had never been used before. And so his birth has no parallel in history as we wrap up. That makes Jesus Christ unique and approachable. Because of his deity, he has power to help you. He has power to come alongside. He has power to do anything. And because of his humanity, he understands you. He he feels with you and for you. He has empathy and sympathy. And so when his deity is matched with his humanity, we have a faith that is not old, it's not outdated, it's not worn out, it's not obsolete, it hasn't outlasted its usefulness. We have a faith that is living and active and powerful, and it's available, verse 5. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. It's available for the very need that you have at this moment. And so if you have a need here this morning, if there's something that you're struggling with, Jesus is there for you. The greatest need that you have is to come to know Jesus, to come to know him as your Savior. That's what Paul did there on that Damascus road. He had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and it changed his life. And if you've never had an encounter with Jesus, he's never changed your life. Today, won't you allow him to do that? Echo homo. Behold the man. Behold Jesus. Look to him. And if you'll look to Jesus today, he'll save you. That's what the scripture says. And today, you could simply pray a simple prayer where you repent of your sin and surrender your life to Jesus and he would come into your heart and change it from the inside out. You could pray something like this, God, I know that you love me and I know you sent Jesus to die for me, to pay the price for my sins on the cross and I'm sorry for my sin. I repent of my sin and today I surrender my life to you, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. If you prayed that prayer today, he did. If you did, would you let me know? Would you send me a message? Just send me a Facebook message. Contact the church office, office at myabilene.org. Let me know what Jesus did for you. If you're a Christian today, hey, you're like Paul. You're a bondservant. You have no rights to yourself. You've been bought with a price. You're an apostle. You're an emissary of the king, a representative of the king. And you've been called and you've been separated. Live like it. Act like it today.